Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope you're doing well. This evening I finished reading Libra by Don DeLillo. A strange book from the 1980s. It's a historical novel uh, set around the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, allegedly by Lee Harvey Oswald, who is the main character of this book. And that is one reason that I'll say it. it's a, I, I recommend reading this book, but it, it is with some reservations that I'll go into. Um, it's a historical novel written about 25 years after the event. And I think the best way to characterize it is the term David Peace uses to describe his own GB84, also set around a historical event, the UK 8485 uh, coal miner strike, which is the term occult history. And so what Peace means by that is there's a, a it's a book, or it's a fictional book around a historical event that includes characters who like ha have a real life counterpart, same name, same person, many of many of the same events transpiring involving that character, um, perhaps some fictional events around that character, fictional characters who interact in realistic ways with the real life character, the characters from real life, um, ideas around what really happened or what could have happened or what may have happened, and then of course components that are, are entirely uh, creations by the author. They're, they're purely fictional creations, the, the characters and the events. Um, and and they're, they, they, they serve to like reveal a, an alternative side of history, a different side of history um, that perhaps looks at it from a, a different perspective. And I think it can be a very effective technique. I think GB84 is one of my favorite books. David Peace is one of my favorite living writers. Libra works on a couple of levels, and then there are others that I think I think it DeLillo aims very high, and he misses the mark. Um, I'm going to briefly just describe kind of what's going on in it. Uh, one of sort of the the main issues I have with the book, there's really two, and uh, and then I'll read a couple of passages that sort of show what DeLillo is capable of as a writer and how he views this book and sort of the interaction between his characters and history. So. The, the first reservation around the book is that the main character of the book is Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged assassin, the murderer of John F. Kennedy. Um, you spend a lot of time, a lot of pages, in the mind of, of someone who's very unstable, who is absolutely, you know, plotting uh, to commit murders, who, plural, who, is, you know, views himself as this agent and change agent within history and is, you know, pretty much failing at, at all of those levels, uh, who's a defector, who abuses his wife. This is not a pleasant character to spend time with. And that's my primary like reservation around the book. The second one I have is that DeLillo fills it with like all of these historical details around the factory in Minsk or you know the apartment in Minsk that Oswald has, the army base in Japan where the U2 flights come out of, the um, the uh, neighborhoods in Oak Cliff, the rooming house in Oak Cliff where Oswald lives. And so we we're f the streets of New Orleans. So we're filled with, with these details that don't always add in to create something that is coherent and, and um, that, that add such verisimilitude to the story that it really helps us move forward. I don't, I don't think we get that. Now, the book does push in a conspiracy of you don't just have Oswald who's looking at um, attempting you know, to, to uh, murder the president. But you also have a group of disaffected former CIA agents, a group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles who are uh, frustrated by the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, who are working together <clears throat> and are trying to use Oswald to work with them in this plot to um, murder John F. Kennedy. You have, and then you have this really weird component, which is a uh, character removed, uh, some 10 plus years removed from the event, named Nicholas Branch, who is almost, the best way to describe him is the way maybe a deist would view God, which is you have this character who is view, who's creating a secret history of the assassination on behalf of the CIA. No one's ever going to read this. No one's ever going to like study this. Um, and he, so he is, and he's working with someone called the curator who sends him all of this information. We get very little time with this branch. He doesn't really give any judgments. He's just there to sort of, reveal a deeper level of conspiracy and an unsettling level of conspiracy. Um, so th those, those are the two reservations. One, you're spending a huge amount of time with Oswald, and two, there's just a lot of details that don't necessarily help the book out. But you get some interesting writing like this. 
He walked through empty downtown Dallas, empty Sunday in the heat and light. He felt the loneliness he always hated to admit to, a vaster isolation than Russia, stranger dreams, a dead white glare burning down. He wanted to carry himself with a clear sense of role, make a move one time that was not disappointed. He walked in the shadows of insurance towers and bank buildings. He thought the only end to isolation was to reach the point where he was no longer separated from the true struggles that went on around him. The name we give this point is history. And so here's my recommendation with this book. I honestly think that if you took the final paragraph or final sentence of each chapter, you would have something absolutely extraordinary. Um, it might be more powerful than the book as a whole. Another example. Uh, the endless fact rubble of the investigations. How many shots? How many gunmen? How many directions? Powerful events breed their own network of inconsistencies. The simple facts elude authentication. How many wounds on the president's body? What is the size and shape of the wounds? The multiple Oswald reappears. Isn't that him in a photograph of a crowd of people on the front steps of the book depository just as the shooting begins? A startling likeness, Branch concedes. He concedes everything. He questions everything, including the basic suppositions we make about our world of light and shadow, solid objects and ordinary sounds, and our ability to measure things, to determine weight, mass, and direction, to see things as they are, recall them clearly, be able to say what happened. He takes refuge in his notes. The notes are becoming an end in themselves. Branch has decided it is premature to make a serious effort to turn these notes into coherent history. Maybe it will always be premature because the data keeps coming, because new lives enter the record all the time. The past is changing, as he writes. So we have these really interesting meditations on history. Um, what bridges the space between them? What makes a connection inevitable? There is a third line. It comes out of dreams, visions, intuitions, prayers, out of the deepest levels of the self. It's not generated by cause and effect like the other two lines. It's a line that cuts across causality, cuts across time. It has no history that we can recognize or understand, but it forces a connection. It puts a man on the path of his destiny. And so DeLillo is capable of these really interesting statements. I don't know how profound they are. <laughs> they can sound profound, um, but again, they're, they're jam-packed in with just these details. Uh, but DeLillo is capable of writing some really, creating some really interesting thoughts around um, the, the influence and significance of one individual in history at one moment in time. And how often we, we don't think of that. We think of like the big picture and, and the, the great movements. Um, and so DeLillo kind of takes this, this, uh, this individual and iconoclastic take on it. Um, it is somewhat fatalistic, but then he also puts in all of these emphases on chance that, you know, Branch in his ultimate history is, is viewing it as a series of chances that, that lead up to this and, and that we have all of these weird intersections um, that lead together. And so again, it's, uh, it's about 450 pages. If this is a subject matter that interests you, I think you might find the, the novel interesting. It does have a lot of, you know, uh, I don't want to say antecedents. It does link to some real world facts, some facts of, of what actually was happening in the 1960s, but a, a fair, most of it is fictional. Um, now, it is not my favorite you know, it is not the most interesting fictional crime novel around the John F. Kennedy assassination, in my opinion. The two that I prefer are The Tears of Autumn by Charles McCary and American Tabloid by James Elroy. All three present totally different ideas around what might have actually happened. Um, Elroy's is really interesting, but I will warn it, the characters and some of the characters in it are deeply like sexist, deeply racist, and use like the N word and stuff like that. So be aware if you're reading Elroy. Um, the Tears of Autumn is, is uh, tied much more closely to uh, the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Um, Libra is also not my favorite Don DeLillo book, <laughs> and it's not Underworld either. Uh, my favorite is probably Running Dog, which is strange and weird. Very weird. Uh, I also, though, think White Noise is equally strange, equally weird. And um, a book that has nothing to do with Libra um, beyond a Kennedy connection is Rubicon Beach by Steve Erickson a good portion of which takes place at the hotel in Los Angeles where uh, John F. Kennedy's brother uh, Bobby Kennedy was murdered five years later four and a half years later 
and this is set in like a post-apocalyptic dystopic world uh, and you can see like LA is flooded and part of part of this book do you, you know is set there in the hotel and almost it's it's a very like haunting section um, so those are some other books uh, the other one I would add is particular with the um, the the anti-Castro Cuban angle in um, Libra and in American tabloid as well is Joan Didion wrote a really interesting book I believe it's just called Miami I mean, yeah Miami uh, it's a nonfiction book it's more of like an extended essay or monograph um, although it's like it was published as a separate book called Miami and that uh, is in her her nonfiction across the culture of the 1960s uh, slouching towards Bethlehem and um, the White Album also is very informed by what happens when you know later on in the 60s after uh, this this like national mourning um, uh, Miami though is set specifically in Miami and deals with uh, you know the Cuban community there and the Cuban refugee community there so those are a number of books that you might read instead of reading Libra or if you really want to read Libra go ahead <laughs> thanks <laughs>